Hello, everybody. It is, uh, it is great to have you with us on this Monday afternoon, and we couldn't be happier uh, to welcome back one of our own, uh, Dr. Ana Velasquez Manana, who is an assistant professor of medicine in UCSF in the Division of Hematology and Oncology, and a thoracic oncologist at the UCSF Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Center, uh, where she also serves as the assistant director for diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And, uh, you know, many of you may know her. She uh, spent uh, four wonderful years here at Mount Sinai Beth Israel as a resident and chief resident uh, before going to UCSF to complete her uh, clinical fellowship in medical oncology. She does tons of research on uh, health services and cancer disparities, is funded by a number of uh, really significant organizations. And, uh, and we really are thrilled that she took some time uh, to come back and spend time with us this afternoon. Dr. Velasquez, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Weissman. I'm really excited to be here. So thank you for the invitation to the chief residents and to everyone. Um, of course, I wish I was there in person, but definitely feels um, nice to be able to see at least we assume some familiar faces um, like Dr. Steinberg, my co-chief, some of the current chiefs and Dr. Rappaport, um, who I remember very fondly from our times in Nine Days In um, back in the day. Um, so today the goal is to give you a whirlwind overview about how health equity is important in our healthcare in general and also in cancer care and how really social determinants of health impact how we deliver care. Um, as Dr. Weissman mentioned, I am an assistant professor at UCSF and I treat patients with lung cancer. I work at the both ends of the spectrum at a safety net hospital and I spend my Wednesdays in a comprehensive cancer center. So I see broad disparities on even the type of care that I'm able to deliver. And it's one of the reasons why I pursue research in this space as my main focus or goal. These are my disclosures, none of which are really relevant to what we will be talking today. And by main objectives of what we will discuss over this next hour, as I mentioned, is understanding what the roles of social determinants of health are as drivers of inequity in cancer care and outcomes. As I am a lung cancer doctor, we will use lung cancer as an example, and particularly clinical trials, since they are super important to all care that we deliver and really, really important in cancer care. Um, and we'll go over some potential strategies to try to narrow health disparities and how everyone, even when it's not cancer related, can think about um, different levels of inequity and how to identify solutions. So to first start, we'll start with a, with a case. Um, and I want you to think about this patient and think of how you would work them up how you would think are some of the barriers or issues that you may encounter um, when trying to treat this patient. And I think this is gonna be really relevant as, as we go through the talk for residents with a lot of issues that you're seeing on the floors too that impact the care that you're able to give. Um, so this is a 45 year old. I am purposely not giving you a gender, not giving you race, but just age, because I want you to think in general and think how you think about this case, who's coming with right leg pain and swelling for two months. When you do your review of systems, has cough for a year, and this patient has never smoked and has no other medical problems. Now imagine if that patient was a triathlete or if he was the New York City major or if he or she was an investment banker or a truck driver or a teacher in a remote rural community in the middle of Wyoming or an immigrant farmer in California or your neighbor who has six children and is a parent and stays at home with their children. How do you think your, um, your diagnosis would change? How do you think your thoughts of how, what this patient has? How do you think their access or way of getting care and getting diagnosed and ending up in your office will change? And this is what is really important and part of why we do health equity and um, cancer disparities care is there's so many ways in which we come with these prescriptions or scripts of diagnostics that really 
introduce certain biases of what we think is more likely to happen in one person or the other. And similarly, there are many different environments um, in which a patient or person lives that can change what they have or how they access healthcare. So after having um, a workup, this patient ends up getting CT scans and is diagnosed with lung cancer. Obviously I am a lung cancer doctor, so that's what we are gonna be talking about. And as we think through the different cases and the different types of patients that I told you in their social context, we have to think up why is that important? Because it impacts how they access care. If you can imagine having somebody who's highly educated or who has resources, who has, you know, works in Wall Street or is a city mayor or is a CEO of a hospital, they're very likely to go down this pink path that goes straight into the doors of BI and get diagnosed very quickly. But if you were somebody who lives really far away or busy taking care of multiple kids, you can't stop working or you don't have insurance, your road into getting diagnosed and getting care, it may be very different and maybe the one in blue and the right. And even for some of us, if you're a resident and you have long working hours, you know, you may not have time to go to your primary care doctor and you have medical problems to take care of, even though you know everything about healthcare, you also have barriers that limit how you can access it. So we may be on that middle path, right on that yellow road, um, particularly if your schedule is, you know, nights and ICUs and weekends. Um, so all of these things are to put in context what we are going to talk about, which is why do we care about health equity and why does it really matter? And um, you know, the silver lining of the many tragedies that have happened over the last three years is that people have really started taking. Um, paying attention and really thinking about why the social context and why the social determinants matter into how we um, deliver care and the health that people have. Um, and all of these things are interconnected. Many of you were there during the peak of COVID, whether it was at interns or residents, medical students, the faculty, and you saw that in your ICUs, the people in the floors that were dying looked differently and how they presented was differently. And the people who were able to go home on oxygen versus those who didn't also was different. Um, we know that in your clinics, who gets vaccinated and who doesn't also matters. And it's different because we all live in a social context and an environment that dictates the type of health and health care that we will get. Um, so to make sure that we go over some definitions so that we all understand terms in the same way, I wanted to briefly go over really when I talk about health equity and why it matters in cancer care, what are we talking about? And health equity really is the state in which everyone has fair and a just opportunity to attain their highest level of health. So if you can imagine that is a really complex term because what is fair, what is just, what is the highest that you could get? And that matters a lot based on, you know, your gender, your race, where do you live? Um, and it may vary for every single person. For somebody who lives, you know, in Puerto Rico like I was, that may be different than for somebody who lives in the United States or for somebody who has access to healthy foods and lives in a farm and is able to grow their own products. That is very different than for somebody who is living, pay, you know, check to check, who needs stamps to be able to buy food and who's unable to afford it. So what truly um, does that mean will depend on each person. So let's give an example to try to put it in context and for us to understand. So imagine that you're going to watch a soccer game. You're watching your sibling, your kid, your cousin, you name it, somebody that you love dearly and you're going with your other family members. So you're walking to see this soccer game, but it's you and your family member and one of your parents is on a wheelchair. So of course they have different needs compared to you. They may not be able to stand in the grades as you do. They may not be able to climb stairs or sit on different areas. If they have, if we have a huge, barrier, they may not be able to see their family member as they are playing soccer. So we have to really think and put into context that 
health, achieving health equity means that we need to be able to provide resources to people that they need to then achieve the best possible health outcome that they can have. Um, and this is why we speak about equity and not equality, which is a term that many of you had heard before. Um, so as it's shown here, this is a graph that most people have seen um, in general and many different varieties of it exist, but tries to highlight what truly those differences are. Um, when we speak about equality, everybody gets the exact same resources. While we're, we're speaking about equity, you can see that the, you know, the shorter woman here is getting two boxes to be able to stand on and the person who's in a wheelchair now has a ramp. So we are able to tailor resources for people to address their specific needs. Now, why does that matter in cancer? As you know, healthcare is super complicated and this is a very simplistic overview of what a cancer pathway or diagnosis looks like. So we have somebody who's sick and may go to their doctor, may get screening. Um, if they're going to your primary care clinics in Ryan Nina or GMA, you know that you're ordering um, mammograms and fit tests and colonoscopies. And there are many different steps throughout that process that require somebody to engage in healthcare, to have insurance, to show up to their appointments, to have support to come to those appointments to be able to understand what we're explaining to them and for them to then be able to access their treatments. And in every single one of those steps, there are ways in which things can go wrong and there are ways in which we can provide in um, non-equitable care for patients. So going back to the person that I presented before, again, 45 year old, comes in with right leg pain and swelling, for two months and a year of cough, and this is actually one of my patients. And they're diagnosed with metastatic lung adenocarcinoma, which is the most common type of lung cancer. Now imagine if this patient was Spanish speaking and uninsured and an immigrant farm worker from California who is eight hours away from San Francisco and needs to drive to get any high level of care, but they're uninsured. Is healthcare going to be covered? How are they going to be able to afford it? If they stop working, they don't have anywhere to live. They can't pay for their roof. They can't pay for rent. They can send money to their family in X country, right? Now let's think about whether if this patient is a black retired coal miner who is working, who is working in West Virginia, he has complete different environment, complete different set of social circumstances, completely different set of risk factors that may lead to this patient having or not um, access to care and differences on how this diagnosis of lung cancer really faces them. And I'm giving these two because besides the age, these are literally the social histories of two of my patients. So we do see this and we have to understand then how do the patients got to us and who they are as a person and how does that impact um, delays that they may have in their care or how are we gonna tailor their care? So why really talk about health equity and lung cancer? You probably are more familiar with breast cancer, or colon cancer, who we see uh, often in the news, um, but actually lung cancer is the number two most common type of cancer in the nation in both men and women only second to prostate and breast that are specific to genders. There is more than 200,000 people that are diagnosed with new lung cancer each year in the United States. And of those, the majority present with stage four disease, meaning non-curable metastatic cancer. Lung cancer is the number one cause of cancer deaths in the country. So, it is very significant, it is important, and it is a disease that have stark disparities and that also most of us know that the majority of lung cancer is preventable, is associated with the use of tobacco products and smoking or exposure to things like coal mining, um, radon, burning wood indoors. If you live in areas you know, 
the rural country in which people cook um, burning wood inside of their house to keep their house warm. Um, so it's one that unfortunately has been associated with a lot of stigma because of primarily having tobacco as the main driver, for which there's less research, unfortunately, on the area, and we see less about lung cancer in the news and in other places, um, but it is very significant, very common, and most people know somebody who has had cancer, and if we ask many of them will have lung cancer. When we talk about incidence, like I said, it's the second most common type of cancer, only second to breast and prostate progenitor. And you can really see here that both in men and women, there are differences in which genders partake in which race and ethnicity particularly it affects. And these are not you know, casual. Um, these are actually driven by patterns of tobacco and smoking and exposure to other um, risk factors, as we see primarily and importantly, black men really have high um, incident rates of lung cancer compared to all the other racial and ethnic groups. And when we think about mortality, similarly, we see differences in mortality across um, the years in lung cancer. Thankfully, as you can see by this graph, lung cancer mortality has significantly improved over the years, um, driven by many things. One of them being novel therapies, of course. Second, policies that are regulating use of tobacco products. And third, the introduction of lung cancer screening, which is still not widely adopted, but hopefully something that you all are doing in your clinics, um, because only 4% of eligible patients are being screened nationally in the US according to the latest statistics. So that is a terrible statistic to have. Um, when we look particularly by different racial and ethnic groups, you will see here um, that Hispanics are at the bottom of this graph, um, followed then by Asian patients, um, American Indian, um, Black in this purple or lilac diamonds, and then white patients in blue. And these differences, many of them are based on use of tobacco or incidence of smoking across these groups, um, access to healthcare, and many other issues. Um, among Latinos, um, there is something called the Hispanic paradox, which is this interesting um, paradox that doesn't make a lot of sense that Latinos live longer despite having cancer um, as a diagnosis or chronic illnesses. Um, it is still not truly understood why that happens, whether it is because there's migration back to home countries that leads to patients that's not being accounted for, whether there is that people who are immigrants and are born in another country have higher survival, which is known compared to those that are acculturated and have been born in the United States based on diet, based on other customs of your life um, and exposures during childhood. But importantly, um, when we look particularly by gender, we start seeing more and more differences and how these lines really separate. And compared to the prior, you can see that black men, particularly the one on top, have the highest mortality rates of all groups and separate really compared to um, white men and the other racial and ethnic groups. So we have to try to understand why do, does that happen and think about ways in which we can um, create interventions to narrow or decrease these disparities. So what is the case and why do we see differences by, based on race, on ethnicity, on insurance, and many other things that we will talk about. This is because of what we know as the social determinants of health, and hopefully this is a graph that you all have seen before, but what we're talking with social determinants of health really are the conditions in which we as humans are born, grow, live, work, and age. Um, and these structures are closely related to social structures that determine our access to education, our, access, our ability to have a job, our ability to access healthcare, um, and shape really our health and our longevity. And 
the social determinants include things like um, our economic stability, our ability to pay bills, to be employed, um, the support that we have in our neighborhood, whether you live in an area, um, if you live in Manhattan that has, you know, trains and buses on every corner versus if you live in a, co in a corner of Jamaica that, pro that has one train line and you have to walk 10 blocks to go to that train and then come get healthcare, that is gonna impact the way in which you're able to live and get preventive services, access food, um, get educated, et cetera. And the main goal here to bring home is that all of these social determinants are really linked to lack of opportunities and lack of resources that patients have that then affect their health, their ability to improve their health, to get treatment, their ability to maintain health, um, and are most responsible for the inequities that we see. Now, these social determinants don't happen out of chance. Um, they happen because historically there's been racial bias and discrimination in our society that has led to both institutional practices, public policies, you know, state and um, federal policies that lead to certain groups having worse care or, or in, um, impending their ability to really access healthcare. When we think about lung cancer, those matter. Um, particularly, we know that patients who have lung cancer, um, the, deaths, the death rates of lung cancer among adults who have low education levels, who have been um, in school for 12 or less years is four times that high as those who have been in school for 16 years or more. Um, we know that most, um, Black patients in the United States have the highest rates of living below the poverty levels um, federally. Um, similarly with Hispanics who also have, you know, double the rates than white patients. And um, there's data also systematic reviews that have shown that among all patients who have cancer and die of cancer, a third of them can be prevented if we're able to eliminate this socioeconomic disparities and the impact of social determinants of health in how people get access to care. So those, that graph that I showed you earlier showing, you know, the differences in mortality across patients um, and across racial groups, again, doesn't happen out of chance, but this is a, a, a direct result of policies and inequities in our society. Um, this is a map of San Francisco, again, highlighting how do all of these are intermeshed or intertwined with each other and affect healthcare. Um, as you can see on these heat maps, the areas that are darker mean higher percentage of um, prevalence of smoking on the left and lack of insurance status on the right. And you'll see that there's a lot of overlap between which areas are warmer or hotter on these maps of people who have higher rates of being uninsured, also have higher rates of um, using tobacco products. And of course, if I told you and put on top of this what the diversity of um, minority groups was, you would imagine, and it is true, it's going to be higher also on these areas that are towards um, the southeast of the actual city. So we know if we look particularly even within a metropolitan um, area of the U.S. and similar would exist if we look at New York and its boroughs, that there are pockets and areas that are, have more patients that are underserved, that have more patients that are affected by different social determinants. And this is the result of you know, historic redlining that happened in the early 1930s. Um, and that since then still we can see its effects. In addition to having access to, um, to healthcare and thinking about preventable and um, factors like smoking, um, having insurance, of course, is really important. And patients who lack health insurance have higher risk of poor outcomes. This is obvious to all of us. And we know that having um, health insurance is one of the most important factors for which people are able to get health care or not. And that matters in terms of driving poor outcomes. Um, so there's a study that found that patients who were uninsured were 45% more likely to die from cancer compared to those 
those who had insurance. Um, so we know that policies like the Medicaid expansion of Obamacare Affordable Care Act that have allowed patients to get insurance have really changed um, the needle on increasing percentages of people who can access um, cancer screening, who can be diagnosed earlier and has really improved um, survival. But as we know, that doesn't happen everywhere. And there are states which still don't have um, Medicare expansion and their patients have differences in mortality. So going back to um, lung cancer and trying to center this a little bit on the clinical side, why all of this matters? Um, well, it matters because how we treat diseases is complex and it, it requires access to both medications, to surgeries, to radiation, and to special tests. Um, lung cancer is super complicated, and I know that in the past, some of my former co-residents have given talks about advances in lung cancer treatment, but one of the keys here is access to multi-model services. So being able to access surgery and radiation oncology and having a medical oncologist who can give um, the appropriate targeted therapies or systemic therapies, immunotherapies to patients. And all of that depends on our ability to get PET scans, to get ABUS, to get pathology reads, to send that pathology for molecular testing um, that costs thousands and thousands of dollars. And that unfortunately across the nation, we are not doing equitably. Um, so there is a myriad of data and papers that have shown um, that patients who are from minority groups, particularly African-American and Hispanic patients who have early stage lung cancer that is a curable disease are a lot less likely to undergo curative intent surgery. And one of the main drivers for this is their ability to access big academic health centers that have thoracic surgeons that are able to do lung cancer surgeries. If you get care in a facility that doesn't have the services or that is busy and unable to provide them, patients are not gonna get the care that they need. Similarly, we know that patients who are black are also 42% less likely to receive radiation compared to patients that are white. And similarly, we know that they're less likely to get a molecular testing, particularly EGFR is one of the most common or known um, targets in lung cancer. And why is that? Because similarly, if you go to locations or places in hospitals that have higher volume and provide lower quality care, patients aren't able to receive the care that they need. And finally, a lot of also the data that we use is driven by representation of different populations in clinical trials. Um, and clinical trials are key because they drive innovation and they drive access to new therapies, particularly in cancer and in lung cancer, in which historically only less than 10% of patients would survive past five years. We need clinical trials and newer drugs to be able to really um, adopt broadly and create the data that shows that there is um, advances or improvement in survival with newer treatments. Um, representation in cancer clinical trials is a problem and it's grim. We know that most of the patients that enroll are white patients um, and there is very, very limited percentage of black, Latino and other um, minority groups that are represented in cancer clinical trials. And over time, the percentage of minorities that have enrolled as our trials get bigger and get more complicated has actually decreased. Those disparities not only exist by race, race and ethnicity, but also based in gender and similarly based on age. Um, even within pay, older adults are underrepresented, but even among older adults who have insurance, we know that similarly, um, socioeconomic status and income really matter. And as you'll see on that table on the right, patients who had lower levels of income were less and less likely to enroll in clinical trials after um, they adjusted for both um, age and gender and race. Um, when looking at lung cancer and newer therapies, we did this study looking at disparities in immunotherapies in lung cancer, 
And similarly, we saw that despite higher high incidence of lung cancer among black patients or Latinos, in general, the percentage of trial participants is five times less than the incidence of the disease and prevalence across these populations. So we are not offering um, access or not providing it to patients who are in need. But why is that important? And what are the real consequences of lacking um, access to clinical trials? Where one of the most important is of course, poor quality of data. We limit the generalizability of our results if the populations that we are including and studying really are narrow. Um, we can't really know what the efficacy of to or toxicities are of those drugs in particular populations. Um, for example, there are drugs in used commonly in colon cancer that one um, that are metabolized by a specific enzyme. And patients who have that enzyme have really, really um, terrible side effects with horrible diarrhea and really are unable to tolerate um, the chemotherapy. So if we're not um, studying these drugs on patients who are from diverse backgrounds, we're not really gonna be able to understand what are the nuances or the toxicities that certain groups can have compared to others. Um, when we think about other important barriers or reasons for us to really broaden how we think about clinical trials and our accruals, we wanna make sure that of course we are um, providing more innovation and discovery. We wanna make sure that similarly, we're not spending and increasing a lot of cost um, with uh, which our healthcare system you know, leadership always cares about by having low accrual of patients and limiting who is able to enroll. Um, and we wanna make sure that we are not broadening disparities in survival and worsening disparities in access to drugs that really can be life-saving. Um, we know that some of these medications, for example, immunotherapies that I just showed you, have really did not enroll diverse patients in trials have been life-saving for diseases like melanoma and head and neck cancers and even lung cancers in which around five to 10% of patients may be cured if they have access to immunotherapies. So what are some of the barriers and how can we think about um, solutions? And I'll go through these slides a little bit fast because the main goal is to highlight some of the barriers and not go in depth into them. Um, but we have to think about what are some individual and community level factors. So awareness and willingness to participate. A lot of people talk about trust. Patients do not trust the healthcare system or don't wanna be you know, a guinea pig in a study. Well, in reality, that is not the case. What has been shown is that once patients are asked if they wanna participate, really race and ethnicity does not impact the rate at which individuals enroll in trials. Um, studies both you know, in New York and Texas who have very diverse populations have shown that if you ask people, they are more likely to participate in trials that even um, minority, for example, Latina women are more likely to participate than non-Latina women or Latinx patients in, um, in New York were similarly two times as likely as the others to say they would join a cancer clinical trial. Um, and studies looking at black patients similarly has suggested that they have similar rates of agreeing to participate. And um, primarily the issue is patients not being asked or not being aware that a trial exists. Um, like I mentioned, trust is one that is often quoted, um, but really here is trust, more than trust in the research or not, is trust in the healthcare system and trust in the physician. So of course, people who have an established relationship with you as the provider will trust you into what you're recommending. Um, most of you, I imagine, will have patients who have told you at one point, what would you do for your family member? What would you do if I was your mom? Um, and in those cases, really, your patient is exhibiting the trust that they have in you. Um, and the other aspect to really consider here is what is the trust of the institution um, and what this institution has done for the community. So there are clinics, for example, I remember when I was a resident and my um, 
um, primary care clinic was in Ryan Nina. Ryan Nina was a known institution in that community in Alphabet City. Everybody surrounding the area would get care there. There was clear interaction between the healthcare staff being members of the community. There was clear trust on what we were doing. Um, so this is the type of, of relationships that we need to build to try to diminish some of those barriers. Um, Further, similarly, when we think about, you need to think about study specific barriers. So whether we're opening them in clinics in which diverse patients are not being seen, you know, are we providing recruitment and consent as we are educating patients in the language that they speak? Um, are the procedures or protocols too intense to follow? Um, require that people take off work, you know, um, three days out of the week, then that's really not going to happen, right? And going to be a limiting um, factor in how people are able to access um, both care and decide or not to participate in some in studies. So now let's try to think about what are some potential solutions. And I'll give you um, a few examples also of work that we do in this space. So all of these problems are really complex and require complex multi-level solutions. These are fancy works that we use, we love to use in research. Um, these um, onion that you'll see here is one graphic that I really like, and it's called the socio-ecological framework. And it basically shows the different levels in which we should think about solutions and problems when we are trying to attack one. Um, so, and think about where particularly you stand and where is your level of impact? Where specifically do you wanna make a change? Um, so for example, if we think about the individual person, um, patients have beliefs, you know, they may or may not know about specific disease and they may have language barriers and they may need support. So we encountered that we had patients who had breast cancer and were um, struggling with trying to get survivorship care. Um, we had, you know, they get, there's something called survivorship care plans that are given when somebody completes cancer treatment, they go to primary care. And with those, there's supposed to be a warm handoff between the patient and um, the oncology team and their, their primary care um, provider. And patients really were saying that they did not feel included, that they felt that they were being basically on a really bad breakup with their oncology team um, and being ignored. So we did focus groups and decided to talk to them and try to identify what things could we do to make them feel better and feel included and understand what survivorship is and how the next steps over the care will um, would be tailored. And one of the things that the patients um, said was that when they were in the cancer clinics, if they were in a waiting room, everybody had cancer and they had a community. But when they went back to their primary care, they really felt neglected and alone. Um, so we decided to create group medical visits, um, which are as the word says, a group in which patients who share some chronic illness in this particular scenario, um, cancer, um, are together, receive some intervention in which they're being taught a particular subject. Um, in this case, it was how to take care of yourself um, and topics related to survivorship like diet and exercise. Um, and then they actually see a provider during that group medical visit. So it's a billable encounter um, for the healthcare team. Um, and we did this over a course of, you know, um, four weeks. So they would get a weekly um, intervention. Um, to be able to adapt this to patients who were Hispanic, um, Latinas, and were Spanish speaking, we had to culturally adapt it. Again, um, thinking about the individual themselves and what needs they have. Um, so we set the stage by again talking to them, what needs do you have? We developed um, a portfolio of what specifically this group medical visits will um, include and how they would be tailored. And then we adapted that with both healthcare staff and patient input from Latinos of what particularly was important to them. So what topics they wanted to speak about. Um, 
you know, how can we adapt a diet intervention to include actually food that they eat um, and that is part of your regular diet. And then we pilot tested this. We of course did um, studies and surveys and spoke to patients and similar to how you would do, you know, QI methods, then we were able to adapt our intervention, modify it and retest it with certain changes. Um, and as you can see here, um, the graphs in the left are pre-intervention questions regarding how do they feel and if they know how to take care of themselves um, and if they know who they should be able to contact uh, about um, getting care and really um, confidence from the patients increased dramatically after being able to receive um, that group intervention. So showing how do we create um, interventions that are tailored to a specific population that can answer a problem that the individuals are having. Um, when we think about interpersonal ones, this matters in terms of how do we interact and also how do they inter the patients interact in their support system. Um, so one thing that is really key and important for us as healthcare providers is to really be proactive in identifying our own biases and thinking who do we call, for example, poor compliant or who do we label on a chart that way. And we know from data that patients who are from racial ethnic minority groups who may have mental health illnesses who may not speak um, English are more likely to be labeled by us as poor compliant. And we know that once somebody does that, you know, in the chart law later, everybody moving forward is gonna call this patient poor compliant, even if it wasn't even true. Um, so one of the keys when thinking about interpersonal relationships is what are our own biases? What are also the biases that we may have based on the lack of diversity of our workforce? And this is a lot of um, the work that I do as assistant director of DEI in my institution is how can we bring people from more diverse backgrounds to really represent what our patients look like. Um, we know that patients who have um, physicians or healthcare teams and providers that speak their same language or that look like them, that share their culture, are more likely to um, uh, participate in trials, are more likely to adhere to treatments and medications and um, adhere to the treatments that were recommended. Um, so some of the work that I've done and, and led here is looking at the underrepresentation of minorities in our research workforce. And when I was at BI, this would sound to me really crazy because I remember my class was very diverse. We had seven Puerto Rican residents just like me. And then I came to California and I am the only one. Um, and I'm the only Latina on my whole division. There's never been one before. There's been two half Latino men, but no Latina women. So in California, yes, that is crazy um, to hear. Um, so a lot of my feelings at that point of shock, I guess, were really changed into how does this actually affect healthcare for patients? And what can we do to make sure that this changes? Um, so we looked at nat national trends. We saw that while diversity medical schools and medicine residence is improving, it's really not in oncology fellowships. Um, and since then we've developed pipeline programs in partnership with ASCO, which is our National Society of Oncology. Um, and have now, this is our third year of hosting a pipeline program for URM medical students to think about oncology as a potential career. So again, thinking of our patients and um, what do we do that affects the healthcare teams, um, but also the relationships that they have and develop that lead to higher quality of care. Um, Further, we have to think of organizational and how our institutions support having or not um, patients from diverse backgrounds. And similarly, our communities. Um, so how do we partner with national and local organizations that might exist, community organizations and leaders in the community to hear what do they need that will lead to advancing trust and advancing care delivery. And this has to really be an inclusive and intentional engagement. Um, so when we people talk about community engagement or speaking with, with partners that are 
in the area that you practice or in the area that you live, you want to make sure that both parties are winning. This is not a we are coming as a healthcare institution to tell you what to do. It's what are your needs and how can we help you do it? Um, a great example of that in lung cancer and how it applies to lung cancer care um, was published last year in JCO, which is one of the, the biggest oncology journal um, by Marjorie Charlotte, who's a colleague of mine at UNC. In North Carolina, they saw really broad disparities in access to surgery, lung cancer curative surgery for patients who are Black. Um, as and you can see on this table in the retrospective control group, only 58% of patients who are Black were getting um, lung cancer surgery compared to 75% of eligible patients. So they went and they met with the community and they asked, what is the problem? Um, and the patients and community members described, we are not, you know, we are having a lot of issues accessing care. We are being ignored. The quality of care that we receive is not good. Patients have trouble navigating how to get to the healthcare system um, and patients feel that they're not being heard. So what they did is created an intervention that had a real-time warning that will identify unmet care milestones for patients. So which patient was missing, things that were needed for that surgery to happen. They gave particular race-specific feedback to the different um, clinics about how they were doing in meeting those milestones. So who's getting the CAT scans or PET scans, at what timing they're getting pathology um, and biopsies, the PFTs and all the other things that we need. And then they added that interpersonal component with a patient navigation um, intervention. And actually what they found was that by doing this, they really advance care for everybody and they narrow disparities. And not only did the patients who were black and who had you know, poor outcomes improve the, the timeliness of getting surgery and the percentage of them that were getting it, but also the white patients improve. So when we think about health equity and we think about interventions to decrease disparities, it is important to think that this is not, this just doesn't only help those minority groups that are disadvantaged. This actually helps everyone. Um, so should be key in everything that we're doing. And then lastly, I'll leave you with a thought on also policy. And that is that, as I mentioned earlier with the example of the Affordable Care Act, a lot of problems with disparities seem huge and monumental and not things that we can particularly tackle ourselves or that we can you know, fix, but they are. I showed you examples of small interventions at each level that you can potentially do. But the biggest impact really is in policy change. And we as individuals really are the ones who can drive that in how we vote and in how we advocate on speaking with our lawmakers and representatives. Um, I, as I said earlier, this was gonna be a whirlwind of particularly disparities, but all of this is really just the tip of the iceberg. And as you know, there's a lot more nuance and detail that goes on how to select um, care for our patients, how to provide it, and how to um, be able to narrow a lot of these inequities. Um, so to leave you here, what can we do? I think my take home points are to really be intentional and think about how social determinants impact the lives of our people and how each patient that you're treating is independent. And you can be intentional as a provider, as a learner, when you're um, you know, on lectures like this one, when you're thinking about research studies or QI projects that you wanna do. And then lastly, when you're advocating for your patients in particularly and for your coworkers. So that's all I have. Um, thank you all so much. I gladly would take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Velasquez, for that incredible um, talk. I'm sure we have lots of questions in, from the audience and from those on Zoom. So please feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. Any questions? Go ahead, Dr. Agwan. Um, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt the, the social policy there. 
Um, I just want to say thank you so much for a great talk. Um, I think super important issues. And you talk a little bit about the pipeline, kind of meeting with medical students and highlighting um, careers in, in oncology and uh, places where, you know, kind of probably all over that folks are underrepresented. Um, speaking from a residency program standpoint, so I'm the residency program director, um, what are some of the strategies you might use for folks who are already in residency, perhaps considering careers already? Some folks are undecided when they come in, but a lot of folks have an idea of what they might want to go into. What are some of the strategies that you might consider at our level? Yeah, um, you know, I think that at the, at the program director level, there's, a couple of things. One is, of course, when you think about recruitment, how do you make that the least bias possible um, in ways of, you know, there's groups that remove names or remove pictures, remove, you know, scores. I know that now that's less of a problem, but we have to think that even letters of recommendation and how they're written, the words that are being used are different by gender or different by race. Um, I think another important fact is really we are medicine in general as a society, we're quite elitist. Um, and we think a lot about institution of training and pedigree of people rather than thinking about their lived experience. Um, and one thing that I've here been pushing a lot for people to do is move from that, we're only going to take people from X and Y institution into what are the actual experiences that people have that they come in, what are their passions and what make them the person that they are today. Um, I use me and Leslie say who many of you know as the biggest example because we both ended up in UCSF that all of our colleagues were from Penn and Harvard, right? And we are definitely not that kind of people, um, but we're actually both faculty here, which meant that we did something good that they liked and you guys did something good training us. Um, so thinking about that, I think it's is key. And then the other part is that it's not just about recruiting, but also thinking about how to create environments in which people feel accepted, um, that they can report microaggressions that will happen, um, and that our faculty are supportive of, of um, trainees. Guiding folks or exposing them to, um, you know, fellowships and specialties like oncology is hard. Um, that is something that we've been thinking a lot about. I can tell you that most people that I speak to know that they want to be an oncologist from experiences that they had in research, from a family member, from undergrad, from medical school. They're not coming to medicine residencies and discovering that they want to be an oncologist. Um, and I think the main driver is because medicine is highly in patient care. Um, so if you're seeing people that are dying every day in, you know, your oncology wards or in the ICU from neutropenic fever, you're going to think that um, specialty is really sad. And it's not, you know, I don't want to do that every day. Um, but if you go to an outpatient clinic, it's going to be really difficult. Um, so I think similarly trying to adopt your um, the rotations that people do is something that will help, particularly those who may not know or coming knowing um, so they can get exposure to the you know broad variety of care and later be better doctors if they understand of course the nuances that go into each of the different specialties thank you thank you so much i think matsuo um dr so our future chief and long thoracic um, pulmonologist Hello, uh, I'm Matsu. I'm one of the rising chiefs for next year. Uh, I was I used to work uh, work in Japan as a pulmonary pulmonary fellow, so I have this background uh, and a lot of cancer care. Um, so I know um, you talked about like uh, some. I guess it was a study about um, Hispanic population having some survival survivorship group. Um, and then I know that in Twitter, there are a lot of uh, survivorship group like EGFR, resistors, uh, cancer, um, all those um, social media groups. Um, but in terms of like, I think um, like this language barrier in our daily practice is a huge um, in terms of, well, I mean, the quality of care, um, the relationship with the patients uh, as well. Uh, is there any, I don't know, study or actual activity in social using social media to promote um, at least, you know, patients 
uh, with similar background, cultural background, language background, uh, group together and then support each other. I know a lot of our societies have, have a lot of um, these kind of a group community, but I was just wondering if that's the case in lung cancer community. Yeah, um, in the groups that you mentioned, yes, EDFR resistor, you know, KRAS kickers, et cetera, they're primarily for English speaking um, people. They do have different, um, they do have, you know, the, the leads connect folks with people who may speak a different language, but most of those groups are primarily for English speakers. Um, I think that we have a long ways to go. If you look at the prostate cancer and breast cancer community and world, there's definitely a lot more groups and support for patients who do not speak English or Spanish speaking. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a move over the last couple of years with foundations, like I'm part of a project from GoTo for lung cancer, which I'm sure that Nick is very familiar with, um, that are developing now educational videos in Spanish. Um, you know, Cancer Grace is another one that has done similar um, and also has been doing it in Chinese because there's a very large Cantonese speaking um, population in the States that has lung cancer and is affected by it. Um, but it, it, there's a lot less in terms of actual patient facing support, more being grown in the um, education perspective. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank I you. think Dr. Rappaport had a question. Yes, Dr. Rappaport. You're on mute. <laughs> Dr. Rappaport, you're on mute. Yes. Hi, Anna. <laughs> Let me see if I can unmute him. I think, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay, so Anna, that was just great. It was great. It's great to see you and that was a great talk. It's, you know, great you're doing so well, but that's not a surprise for us. Um, but my question is a difficult one. And I was particularly intrigued by the slide showing equity in healthcare. And so it seems to me that obtaining equity in healthcare is a political problem. And especially in today's, I don't know how to say this, uh, charged climate, um, what are you and what are others and what can we all do politically to you know, engender um, equity in healthcare? Yes, I 100% agree with you. It is a, I have, how can I say this? It is a political problem because we're in a polarized society that has made it a political problem. Equity and access to health or having health should not be a political problem. But unfortunately, our policies say differently, right? Um, and the state in which you live determines the policies that you live by and your ability to access care. Um, so I would encourage people to one, things that you can change are how you as a provider provide care. You can change how you vote as an individual person. You can speak up and show inequities that your healthcare system may be um, without knowing, let's say promoting, um, and think about ways to change those. And you can get involved in advocacy at both local and national levels. Um, so literally, you know, a week ago, I was flying to Washington DC to go to the ASCO Hill Day. Um, and during that day, we always joke with, you know, the California representatives that we are preaching to the choir because we really don't have to do a lot of convincing people now that equity is important. Um, but we are there to kind of be, you know, the, the cheerleaders of our colleagues who are on states that have an uphill battle to try to convince folks about why they shouldn't cut you know, um, support for healthcare for veterans or why the NIH and NCI need more funding. Um, so I think that our biggest impact is as individuals in speaking up and advocating both locally and nationally um, and speaking with our colleagues that a lot of these problems, even though they're made into politics, shouldn't be. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll just jump on top of that. You're awesome, Anna. We mm -hmm. love seeing you again. Um, I hope to see you at ASCO in a couple of weeks. Um, and, and the other thing is, is, you know, sometimes it's pairing up with other organizations like the American Cancer Society who 
have people who are actually on Capitol Hill and their job is, you know, we talk about lobbyists as essentially a curse word because um, most of the time these people are lobbying for things we don't support. Uh, but lobbyists can lobby for biomarker testing and screening and all the good stuff. So I was actually just part of a panel a, a month or two ago that was about biomarker testing for New York State, and they are going to the Capitol in a week or two to propose a new bill. So, you know, having experts like like uh, our speaker today pairing up with uh, these these other uh, people to get the word across and really what the, these people talk about is there has to be some stake in the game. They have to have a constituent or have a family member or somebody who has a similar situation. So to personalize these issues, to really get your the people who have a voice in the government to make these changes. Thank you so much, Dr. Rose. I know it's 101, but I just wanna close off by saying that thank you so much, Dr. Velasquez, for this incredible talk. I know the majority of our audience are internists and I, I do wanna highlight that I think you know, a lot of this is not only happening at the oncology level. I think it's so important for our primary care folks and our hospitalists to have these conversations and, and you know, uh, advocate for their patients. Um, uh, Dr. Velasquez, I know you highlighted this, but I think, you know, even with lung cancer screening, there's so many disparities in the screening itself. You know, uh, African-American patients are at a higher risk and they may not be included in the lung cancer screening. So I think it's really up to our internists and primary care docs to really advocate for their patients, talk about smoking cessation. And I really, really appreciate your talk and, and highlighting that for all of us, even for those that are not going into oncology. So thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for coming together and supporting our incredible alumni today. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Anna. Great to see you. Yeah, thank was... you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week for another Grand Rounds. Bye, friend. Take care. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great job, Anna. Bye. Thank you so much.